Club. We are gathered here this morning for the sixth session in a series of congressional hall, town hall meetings with uh, congressional representatives here in the state of Illinois. Um, we will start this momentarily. Um, what I'm asking of everybody, particularly here in the hall, if you would remain silent because this is being recorded, it's also being live streamed to those that, uh, uh, in terms of following the, what's the best protocol for them in dealing with this uh, coronavirus, elected to uh, join us online. So it's very important that you minimize uh, the side talk and uh, remain silent and, and enable everyone to hear uh, what is going to be said this morning. All right, uh, we're getting a little started a little bit late, but inshallah, everybody will keep their remarks short to the point in terms of the opening part of this uh, program today. Um, I want to introduce myself. I just started there. My name is Abdullah Mitchell. I'm the executive director of the Council of Islamic Organizations. And uh, on behalf of the board and the uh, staff at CIBC, as well as the board and staff here at Islamic Foundation North, we welcome you today and we thank you for joining us in this particular uh, town hall session. Before I would go to officially, a, a, we're in a, a, a house of worship and it is appropriate that we start a meeting in, in, our, uh, this, in our venue and there will be a short recitation of a, a scripture, of Holy Quran, of Ma Shek, and uh, Miriam Shek will provide the translation. So, Ma. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. He is with you wherever you are, and Allah is watchful of whatever you do. 
to him belong the kingdom of the heaven and the earth, and to Allah all matters are returned. He makes the night enter into the day, and makes the day enter into the night, and he is all knowing about whatever lies in the heart. Thank you. Thank you for the recitation. And now, um, let me let us begin the program. Democracy demands our engagement with elected officials to define priorities, and then working with those leaders to build awareness and support for policies which promise a greater good for the whole of the community. CIOGC facilitates these important civic responsibilities in and among the constituents of its member organizations, from voter registration, to candidate forms, to advocacy days in Springfield, and now our monthly town hall meetings with our elected congressional representatives. It is through these town meetings that there's an opportunity for you, for the congressman, to share his policy priorities with the Muslim community in his district. The opportunity for you as members of the 10th Congressional District, is to formulate your concerns and questions with this person who is charged with representing your interests in Congress, and more importantly, how both the, how the Congressional representative and you as members of the community can work a, to bring a greater understanding how we can work together to better serve our common interests. With that said, now this program will be moderated by Amir Ahmed and, and Akia Bilal. Uh, I will be introducing them shortly, but at this time I want to uh, turn the platform quickly over uh, for some welcome remarks by the president of IFN, Jasim Anwar. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, salam and peace to all of you. On behalf of Islamic Foundation Law, I would like to welcome you all and our honorable congressman, Brett Schneider. First, I will take this opportunity to share briefly the activities at IFN. IFN is proud to have over 500 members and Muslim community has been exponentially growing now and so we are serving them 4,000 people in the Lake County. We are at the forefront of civic engagement, outreach and charity programs. We join hands with other local organizations such as CIDC, Helping Hand, here, Lake County and many more. Recognizing the increased healthcare cost, IFN is proud of running free health clinic for uninsured and underinsured people. We believe in saving the lives of our fellow humans, so we are also proud to have blood drive two times in a year. We believe in bringing the joy to the needy people. I have been partnering every year with the Mayor of the Walking and in Turkey giveaway program on the occasion of Thanksgiving. Vulnerable people of our society needs our attention and support. A great team of IFN Family Advocacy Committee has provided a hotline number to support the people during the mental crisis, domestic issues, and violence. We also participate in highway cleaning program. As you know, the number of the refugees and their needs are growing. We have been on the forefront and supporting and helping out the Syrians and the Mohinga and many more refugees for many, many years. 
A strong social justice is a need of our, and the IFL has been engaged in social justice and has a great social justice task force. We are proud to have our annual interfaith and civic engagement program during the Ramadan, where we invite people from the different churches, temples, and synagogues and break the fast together, which enables the spreading of the love, understanding, and commonality among different faiths. During this unprecedented pandemic, we are at the forefront of for the safety of and the health of all the people in Lake County. IFN COVID-19 Task Force is serving community to include the CDC and the local guidelines effectively. We are also providing free COVID testing and vaccine. Recognizing the economic hardship during this pandemic, IFN also provide free food distribution services every month and to needy people. This event is scheduled for today and is underway outside. At the end, I am thankful to the Congressman Brad Schneider for visiting IFN that will help to build good relations and understanding and I am confident that his support will help us better to serve the people of District 10. Thank you very much. Uh, what we're uh, trying to do also is to show you the breadth and scope of uh, members of the Muslim community here in the 11th, uh, 10th district. And at this time, we have just two more introductions here. Uh, this is Faisal Mahmoud, the president of Islamic Center, Community Center of Displaced. Assalamu alaikum. We our uh, representative, uh, Honorable Congressman Mike Fagan, is here to hear our side of the story. Uh, uh, we are, I, I am the president of the Islamic Community Center of Displaced, ICCD. We are 1,500 family strong member very active in the community. And some of the things, you know, uh, that our project is doing to help the community is uh, basically doing Feed the Hungry Drive. We feed the Hungry uh, every Saturday. The program has been suspended because of the COVID. We were actively involved in the uh, Census Bureau account with CIBC. The other thing that we do, uh, a lot of these people are from the poor community. And we are giving charity as a part of our faith, you know, it's called Zakat. Uh, so we do that. We distribute about five to six thousand dollars every month to these people who need it and cannot get the help from the government. The other uh, thing that our community is involved in interfaith with other communities and other uh, faith groups. And, uh, and uh, we think, uh, the other thing that we are involved in is, is basically, like I said, we have 1,500 strong family very actively involved in, in our community and beyond. You know, we're not just helping the Muslims, we are helping uh, the non-Muslims as well who come for help. And the uh, last thing I want to mention is we also have a health clinic, uh, courtesy of CCN, Compassionate Care Network, and they come uh, almost every month twice uh, to conduct uh, you know, their testing. Well, Finally, a, uh, a community organization right here in Washington, Illinois, the President uh, of Oski Bernie. Uh, welcome, I'm with, as he said, the Urban Muslim Minority Alliance. Is that better? Okay. Um, we have been uh, making a powerful difference in the Waukegan Lake County community since 2004. Uh, the Newman Center was founded in a response to the great need for assistance to individuals and families living in deep poverty. We provide valuable services that provide hope and guidance that offers a hand up rather than a hand out. We have a food pantry, adult education classes, workforce development, and we just introduced affordable housing 
Uh, here to date, we've probably distributed over 3,591 bags of food, which equates to about 100,000 meals. Um, you know, with the help of CIMPC, IFN, the Fat Chicago, and the Illinois Muslim Civic Coalition, we've been able to start making a great stride and making a difference in the Lake County Marquee community. And we would like to invite you out again to come visit our center and see what we do throughout the community. Thank you. All right. Now I think we need to transition because we're on a tight schedule. I know uh, Congressman Schneider is going to stay as long as he can, but he does have a prior commitment. So with that said, uh, let us now introduce the two moderators for today. Uh, uh, Amir Ahmed, uh, who is a, a long time, over a decade of service here at the I, uh, IFN, also by trade an electrical engineer, uh, and he will along with Sister Nikia Bilal, uh, Sister Nikia Bilal, I've known for a long time. <laughs> Her father and I have been friends, and I know the family, and uh, she, by, by profession, she's an attorney, and uh, we'll welcome them both to come forward to lead us through the next session of, uh, of the program. Thank you.
Uh, more than 330 million vaccines have been uh, uh, administered here in the United States. More than 170 million people have gotten their vaccine. We have 330 million people. We need everyone who can get, get vaccinated. But that's a big deal. The assistance that's been provided to small businesses in our local communities through the American Rescue Plan is critical to bridge this time of standstill. I've been, last week I was visiting a, a number of businesses, everything from a, a day camp to a dance school uh, to restaurants, um, understanding how the PPP program and the CARES Act and the, the uh, Shutter Venue program and the Rescue Plan and other aspects uh, were critical. It's so important that we continue to support our local businesses and do everything we can to, to maintain our strong economy. And we've seen a strong economy starting to pick up. Last month, more than 945 million jobs were created, in no small part because of the investments made in, in the American Rescue Plan. Over the last three months, we're averaging over 800,000 new jobs every month. But we're still 6 million jobs short of where we were at the beginning of the pandemic. Good news again, the economy itself, the economic, uh, the size of our economy is back to what it was before the pandemic, but there's still, still too many people who are struggling to get back into the workforce. That's why the investment in soft infrastructure such as child care, senior care, the ability for people to get back to work is also crucial, and that's part of the next step Congress is taking. Uh, as I'm sure you know that the Senate passed a bipartisan infrastructure plan last week, and the outlines of the Build Back Better agenda, the $3.5 uh, trillion dollar, uh, package uh, that uh, will go through reconciliation. I'm proud to be part of a group called the uh, Problem Solvers Caucus, a bipartisan group in the House, that was actually the initial drafters of this bipartisan agenda, put it forward, worked with the Senate, they carried it forward, and hopefully now we'll see that the infrastructure package pass through the, um, uh, the House and we can get to the President's desk. Just an example of why it's important in our local community, our metro system has 834 bridges with life expectancies of 70 to 100 years. 400 of the bridges you take the train on if you take the metro train, 400 of the bridges in our area are more than 100 years old. We need to invest trillions of dollars to spread our infrastructure back to the earth. It needs to be, it has to be a partnership between the federal government, our local and state governments, and, the, and private industry. And the $1.2 trillion infrastructure package is a piece of that. But the Build Back Better agenda is also critical. If infrastructure is the things we don't think about when we go about our daily lives, when we wake up in the morning and turn on the lights, we expect the electricity to be there. If you're like me, you look at your cell phone to see if anything happened overnight, you want to know that your broadband is working, especially if you're working from home or you have kids who are in school and are studying from home. When we turn on the tap water, we want to know that our water is clean and safe. We get in our cars to to work on the roads that we travel are safe, and then when we get to our jobs, everything will be fine. But if you have children, I see we have a number of young people here today. If you have children, you also want to know that if you drop your kids off at daycare or take them to school or uh, they, they get to school on a school bus, that they're going to be safe during the day. And you don't have to worry all day long. In fact, if you are worrying all day long about your kids, you're not going to be able to do the work we need you to do to grow our economy. So that soft side is also critical infrastructure, and that's why it's important that we move forward on both of these, and I look forward to doing uh, that as well. Uh, I have many other things to talk about, but I want to get to questions. The last thing I'll touch on is uh, voting rights and voting. We know that democracy is work when people participate. That's why we're here talking to each other. That's why every day I am out in the district talking to folks. The most fundamental aspect of our democracy is the right to vote. Everyone in this country should know that they can cast their vote securely and confidently, that their vote will be counted, and that the tabulation of all the votes will reflect the will of the people. That's under attack in this country, and we need to make sure that we continue to work to protect that right. That's why I was proud to sponsor H.R. 1, the For the People Act, that passed the House, but unfortunately stalled in the Senate. I look forward to continuing to work on H.R. 4, the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act, I will show this last year and I'll turn over the questions. We moved offices in Washington uh, this year. Uh, every, after every election, there's a shuffle because people retire and lose their election. And there's a lottery process to go by over to Missouri. We wanted a bigger office, most of my team, because they were confined to a very tight space. But it was our turn. It was one office that was uh, better than the others. We took it, and I know he was in the office prior 
that it's all nothing to do with that. It was only after I uh, selected the office that I realized that I had John Lewis's whole office. The fact that I get to follow in the footsteps, sit in the space, what is sacred space to me, of the great John Lewis is a great honor. But it also is a great responsibility to make sure that we honor his memory and hold up his legacy by advancing and passing HR for the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. With that, I'm going to turn over to questions. So my first question, uh, the first question, Congressman, uh, is regarding uh, Kathleen Oxley's mission, that being elected uh, from Beverly Industry in Washington, and Rentage Social and General in Virginia. As early as 2018, uh, to date, we have not even uh, been informed of an assessment of the health risk to be the mission opposed to many of us who live here and work in the vicinity of these uh, facilities. So I have a very part question. I'll give you question one, two, and three, and then I'll let you give you the answer. Question one, what information do you have regarding who is responsible for completing a health assessment? Question two, what is the status of the health assessment report for the audience here? And number three, how can you assist us to expedite the completion of the report and work for implementation of any recommendation? Uh, 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 great, thank you for the question. I could spend an entire hour talking about this. I'll try to make it as succinct as, as, as possible. Uh, as you mentioned, there are two facilities in the 10th district uh, that use uh, a chemical called ethylene oxide or UTO. Uh, one uses it in manufacture of uh, antifreeze for your cars, uh, the other uses it to sanitize um, medical equipment, medical supplies. Uh, and these are the two primary uses of around the country. This is a widely used chemical. In 2016, the uh, national, the federal environmental protection agency reclassified ethylene oxide as a probable carcinogen to known carcinogen. It is a, a known um, cancer causing agent. Uh, and unfortunately, the EPA at that time, and it still hasn't issued the next step, saying, well, if it changed from probable to known, how do we make sure that it, when it's being used, it's being used in the safest way possible? And that came to our attention uh, in uh, 2018. Uh, it was Sterigenics in, in Lillibrook, if you know that story. And then as that story started to develop, we, we heard about the sites here. Uh, I've been a, a leader on this issue, working, trying to get the EPA to address and, and, and update its regulations, to work with our communities to move forward. In fact, I, I uh, have formed a bipartisan task force addressing this issue. We uh, introduced legislation. Uh, that is a federal piece. On the state, though, it's also the same uh, uh, issue. Uh, you asked who's responsible for the health assessment, and that is it was act, it's actually at a state level. I'm proud to say, um, working in conjunction with our local legislators at the state level, they rest with the senators. Uh, we have moved forward. Illinois has the most stringent laws on the use of ethylene oxide. Uh, both companies have taken uh, substantial steps to, uh, to uh, bring their uh, emissions down uh, substantially, 99 uh, plus percent reduction is what they're saying. But we can't just take the work for it. We need ongoing ambient air uh, monitoring. It's not just a matter of, of, uh, of modeling, which is what a former EPA director has done for. Uh, we have named the former EPA director, uh, the new EPA coming in. We have requested that meeting uh, on our task force. Uh, we do work with the state. Uh, there, they put our reports as well as Lake County. You can get that information at, at Lake County. Uh, but at, at, at this point, we will continue to work to make sure that not just here in Lake County, but anywhere in the country, the EPO is used, is used safely, uh, keeping uh, the air we breathe clean and safe for all of us. Thank you, Congressman. So for the next question, I'll uh, ask my own part of the uh, media. Good afternoon, I'm Alani Um, we know that uh, I have been in this 
focus on the public land, which is one of the busy organizing institutions out here, are working to address this issue. And we know that you frequently employ a lot of support of um, appropriations for their mission to increase affordable housing while keeping in particular the state. So that we might like know if there are any other policy proposals that you have to address the support of affordable housing with them. Uh, thank you. Uh, very important question. It's not just the Lake County issue, it's national issue. We have a shortage of, of housing in general, affordable housing in particular. Uh, we need to uh, approach it in uh, not, there's no one single solution we have to take a, a number of approaches and, and, and make sure that you know, if voting is a fundamental need for democracy, housing is a fundamental need for the community. People know that they have a safe place to stay, uh, to make their families, to build their families, to, to secure their, their future. Uh, we've talked about some of these things in, in grants and in proposals to, to try to build more housing. Uh, part of it is, I'm on the Ways and Means Committee, which is responsible for all tax policy. Part of it is making sure that we have tax policy that continues to promote financing for affordable housing projects uh, across our nation, including this here in Lake County. And uh, I know co-sponsored legislation that will do that, uh, working very closely uh, with local communities so that we'll continue to see more investment into affordable housing projects. Uh, the other piece is, it's not just to have the money to build these, it's to make sure that these, these are built, being built within our community in a way that promotes diversity, uh, address equity issues, uh, ensuring that affordable housing is quality housing as well, and we work with legislation to do that also. Um, in our community, there are two separate agencies that are responsible for their time investment for this in particular. Um, we have suggestions for programs at the federal level that can help with the needs um, of these kinds of agencies or similar agencies. So, at, at the federal level, um, I guess that there, you can put what we can do into a number of buckets. Uh, of course, the most important aspect of any project is the, the funding, that financing. Uh, and uh, so that's the first two buckets that I mentioned. One is the uh, low income housing tax credit, which creates the, the uh, incentive for capital to come into these projects. Second is direct grants uh, that uh, provide money for agencies to make the roof and the federal government does that. Principally through uh, programs like community development, community development block grants. So the federal government doesn't necessarily give to specific agency, we can give to community, whether it's uh, Illinois, uh, Lake County, or City of Waukegan. Those would be three different community development block plans. But uh, knowing that where the needs are specific within a community is better than at a community level than 435 representatives in Washington or the worst of bureaucrats in Washington can uh, find a space on a map and then with no neighborhoods uh, necessarily. Um, and then the third one is just making sure we have policies that are promoting the equity, promoting that, that move. Uh, another uh, bill that, that I, I've been working on for a number of years now is uh, 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 Fair Housing Equity Act to ensure that everyone has access to quality housing, that they can't be discriminated against, they can't be discriminated based on their uh, race, on their faith, on their uh, uh, gender orientation, uh, that's something that we need to continue to push and promote as well. Thank you, Councilman. I'm going to turn it down to So, uh, next question, Congressman, uh, is also a two part question. Uh, I would say a three part question. Regarding the uh, infrastructure budget that we did, we just had in the Senate. Uh, uh, good work, uh, you know, uh, the Senate, you know, where Bird is initiated. With the Senate approving, taking up the project resolution for infrastructure, there is a great whether the scope of the spending resolution sufficiently addresses the needs of the community. Question one How does the Senate resolution address the needs of the residents of the Kent District? You had mentioned earlier that there are bridges that need a hundred years old. Are any of the bridges that fall within the Kent District? That's, uh, that's one question. Second, work opportunities with the story for small business developers and job creation in our community. And question three, what points will you try to create in the upcoming budget to achieve this definitive declaration of the same uh, Great questions. Uh, uh, broadly speaking, we have the, the Senate bill uh, passed the Senate, the House is now picking up. Uh, so far, that uh, $1.2 trillion 
we passed something called the Invest, Invest Act in the House prior to the Senate moving up there to bring the two together. It is the Invest in America Act. Uh, in, the, in the Invest Act, uh, I advocated uh, for a number of projects. I'm pleased to say all of them were, all of them I advocated for were included uh, in the Invest Act. Uh, I haven't, uh, the, the Senate one is not as precise, but let's see to those that's going to happen in, in, the, in the next process. So as far as what I see as my primary role, not just here, but in everything I do, is to understand the needs of the 10th district and advocate for them uh, as strongly as every other representative should be advocating for their own district. That is the role we have. I represent the 10th district. Uh, in doing that, it's understanding what are, what are the needs. For example, one of our greatest needs in this district uh, relates to flooding. Uh, as uh, you all have shared have experience over the last number of years, especially 2013 and 2017, where we had widespread flooding, uh, there are places where every time it rains, there are risks of, of flooding. And so, for example, uh, we requested uh, $3.1 uh, million dollar for the deep slough uh, in uh, Waukegan Park City, right on the border of the two. Uh, that is a, a project that would uh, both uh, hold more water if uh, we uh, get this money to make, make, make the improvements and channel the water more uh, effectively Make sure that it, it's not going into developed areas that are leading to places where it, it won't have the, the same impact. Uh, that is something that is we we identified that project uh, by talking to the community, by understanding what was important. We're working with not just Lake County Board, but the, uh, uh, the leadership of Waukegan uh, and uh, uh, Park City, as well as uh, there's a school. Uh, Crystal Ray School, uh, right at the back of the Daily School, our project will provide them an outdoor classroom. So, we, we're, this one we're really able to achieve a win, 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 to probably go through more uh, outcomes. Uh, there's a, a flood uh, project in Zion, there's a, a street resurfacing project in Zion that uh, we have requested, it, and that money has been approved. On the House side, not on the Senate, so we have continued to fight to make sure that that, that that goes through. Projects in North Chicago and Mount Prospect in, in None of you uh, that I'm advocating for. So that is, is my primary goal, my primary job, and I'll continue to do that uh, through this bill as well as the reconciliation bill. Again, it's not just the hard infrastructure, but it's an investment in human capital. Uh, in particular, uh, the expansion of the child tax credit, as an example, uh, going from, uh, it, well, this year we expanded it, uh, eligibility as well as making it fundable and increasing the amount to $3,600 for children. Uh, five hundred three thousand dollars a year um, for children six to seventeen, and from June to uh, December, from July to December this year, uh, that's going to be paid directly on a monthly basis. Estimated to affect one hundred twenty thousand kids in like in uh, in the 10th district, and lift eighty five hundred kids out of poverty, meaning that children born in poverty won't have to live in poverty for the rest of their lives. Thank you, thank you, Mr. So for, for the audience, if you have a question, uh, for the staff is that you can ask him for the next part, and you can uh, write your question, and he can write his questions to us. Uh, I am very good at sending him back to the afternoon for you. Okay, our next question is at the hybrid. Um, I'm about to be in the capacity um, for the period of time. So it's going to cover uh, gun legislation as well as rising from the media and that kind of uh, Both have been rising in the United States, unfortunately, over the last ten or so years. And mosques, synagogues, churches are all worried about when the next mass shooting might happen. So we're wondering, two part question. Uh, what policy gaps do you believe exist in the government's current uh, article to come back to the debate? That's the first question. And then the second, uh, what policy proposals do you offer to address the increase in gun violence um, that we see in the United States? Let me sub separate those two. I know you have to go, but I think they're important to uh, answer separately. I can answer the second one first, which is gun violence. We have to have a gun violence, and it's not new. Um, Later, uh, so it's for ringing the video. But um, it's, it, it's not new. I can tell you from my own personal experience. Um, in Jewish tradition, you're named after someone who's passed away. Uh, I'm named after my uncle Sam. Uh, my uncle Scott, so that's 
Uh, this is my mother, Don Bozo, in 1943. Uh, he was a lawyer, so then walked into his office, shot him for a time. Called the police and then sat down and he bled to death. Um, if you talk to my family 80 years later and ask them about that, if you ask the mother about that, when they talk about it, it says if it happened yesterday. That my family story is happening every day around the country. And in particular, in communities that are economically challenged, communities that uh, are predominantly are people of color, um, young kids are afraid to go to school on their path to school, getting shot in, 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 in parts. Uh, and there's a lot of challenges we face, but there are things that we can do. Uh, one of the things I was proud to be a co sponsor of, and we passed down twice in the house with HR8, universal background checks. It's not a panacea, it won't solve everything, but if we can have background checks on 40% of the men transfers today that don't have those checks, we can at least reduce the, the illegal acquisition of guns. We're also seeing, you may have seen it in the news recently, there was an arrest on this for trafficking or straw purchases, people buying guns for other people who shouldn't, who aren't able to buy guns and transfer them to them and they don't pay crimes. Making those straw purchases a federal crime. Transferring guns across state lines. Most of the guns, not most, many of the guns used in time in Chicago aren't purchased in Illinois, they're purchased in Indiana, they're purchased in Mississippi, and right here, uh, where it's easy to buy them. If you go out to the East Coast, guns bought in Virginia are, are transited from Virginia all across up into the, the northeast part of the country because in Virginia it's easier to buy a gun and then you move it there. If we can do those things, we can make a better state step forward. I'm getting my five minute warning, so I'll, I'll be quick on this. Um, but we also have to work and change the culture. There's a tradition in this country of people thinking that kids hunting or or target shooting, whoever might be, and teaching responsibility, that's not what we have in the problem. There's another tradition in this country where kids prove their manhood by getting a gun, by using a gun. We have to work to address that. And it's more than just the access to guns. We need to work on improving opportunities, increasing access to education and to jobs. And, and we have to do all of that. So this is something I'm very passionate about. I am part of the uh, uh, Gun Violence Prevention Task Force in Congress happened since I got there. The first speech I ever gave as a member of Congress was on guns. Uh, again, I can talk about that all day. Uh, the, the second, uh, well, the first question is also very important. We are seeing in this country more division, more prejudice, more hate, and any hate is wrong. And any hate in this country is a cancer that eats away, that who we are as a nation will be inspired to be. So, uh, most recently, um, I signed a letter with uh, J.N.G. Kaufman, Ilhan Omar, uh, calling for the creation of a special envoy for Islamophobia. Uh, this is something we have uh, in, 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 in the State Department, the time in the United States, around the world. Uh, we need to work to address it, and the United States has to be a, a leader in addressing those challenges. At the same time, with, with anti Semitism, uh, I entered legislation with Chris Smith and uh, uh, and have elevated that to the level of, of a full ambassador. Hate anywhere is a threat to all of us. Hate of anyone is a threat to all of us. We need to call it out from where we see it. Thank you. 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 There is a sharp division between the uh, UN uh, position on the case of Israel in terms of its continued value or real value of the occupation. We have established in the settlements that are dispossessing Palestinians in Jerusalem and around the world. And of course, the sun is off, um, the conflict of broke out, um, and states are off. Uh, so, we have a couple questions on this. Do you accept the position that continued expansion of settlements by the nation's Israel is in violation of international law? That's the first question. Uh, no uh, you want to do the other? I am going to comment. So, what policy initiatives um, will you support um, to establish the territorial rights of Palestinians? And that would be out of that one as well. Um, that's the point. We still don't know they have it on the other side. Let me first touch on why I want to have all, all the questions together. This is not a simple issue. And if you look at any one aspect of it, you're not looking at the whole in which to look at the whole. Let me first think on where I stand on, on the basic principle. The, the land between the river and the sea, which is the 
piece of the Palestinian mandate that the British took over in World War after World War One, the second piece in Transjordan, which became a, a nation of Jordan, is a land with two peoples, both of whom have legitimate claims to the same territory. Arabs and Jews. There's no question that both have legitimate claims that they have a deep, long connection to this, this land, that they have identified their history to this land. So I believe the outcome that will achieve peace for both these people are two states, a the Jewish state of Israel living side by side with the Palestinian state, in peace and prosperity for both people. And the only way to successfully achieve it, I believe, is for the two peoples to negotiate in good faith and honor to achieve that two state solution. And that's why I've committed myself to my entire life. And if you don't understand, if you don't understand the history of both sides, and the connection of both sides, you're doing a, doing a disservice to both sides. And that's why in Congress, I led uh, uh, many efforts, and I will uh, continue, continue to lead the effort to ensure that the U.S. Congress stands solidly committed to a two-state solution. The question of occupation is a complicated one. The UN partitioned the land in 1947. Israel declared its independence in 1948. The Palestinians rejected that partition. There was a war that ended in an armistice in 1949. That armistice is the green line. And when we talk about the two states, those, that is the line that we're talking about. What is the West Bank today was occupied at that time by Jordan. What is Gaza today is occupied by Egypt. In 1967, there was another war, the war, war between 49 and 67. In 1967, Israel defeated Egypt, Jordan, and Syria in a war and ended up with the territory of Gaza, the West Bank, and the Golan. That is the facts of where we are. It doesn't change what I said at the very beginning. You have two people with operations to say, but how do we get there? I can go on and this, I can lecture on all day and talk about this and engage in conversation. I, I do it all the time. But the fact of the matter is the role of the United States, I believe, should be creating and fostering a context and a climate where both sides, Israelis and Palestinians, make the hard choices they have to on behalf of peace and for their people to lift up both sides and achieve that two-state solution. So when it comes to the settlements, um, the settlements don't advance peace. But I would also argue that the settlements are not a barrier preventing the Palestinians from negotiating. In fact, it's the opposite. The longer the Palestinians refuse to negotiate, those forces that will push the settlements have more time and space to push the settlements. And I'll also argue that the rockets from Gaza, 4,500 rockets in 11 days from Gaza in the last conflict, don't end the peace And the refusal to recognize Israel doesn't end the peace. Both sides have to come to the table, respect each other, and aspire to a common goal of peace and religion. The last thing I have to on this is, if you look at what's happening in the broader region with the Abraham Accords, that Israel is negotiating and making normalized relations with um, UAE, with Bahrain, with Sudan, with Morocco, the more that Israel and the Arab world can come together to live in peace in general, not be getting the interests of the Palestinians, but working together to advance the interests of the Palestinians, the Israelis, and the rest of the region, the better it is for everyone in the region and the rest of the world. And so I also have legislation that is promoting and working to advance the opportunities to build on the Abraham Accords and make sure that there is peace in the region. And all people can have the aspirations that here in the United States we take for granted and we want to our children. A bright future, a good education, quality job, and peace. I have one follow-up question regarding that. Um, um, does the U.S. possibly weaken its, its, its role as a peace when, according to the Palestinians, how many of the diaspora know the fears that they're the one side is Support of Israel's rights, but not acknowledgement of the rights of the 
I mean, I, I think hopefully my students, like all of the Palestinians, I was in the area uh, last month. Uh, we went to Jerusalem, we went to Ramallah, uh, we met with the, the new Prime Minister of Israel, uh, uh, Mahmoud Ben, we met with uh, uh, Mahmoud Abbas for three hours uh, in his offices in, in Lusada. Um, the United States, from a policy standpoint, I believe needs to be very good. Israel is one of our strongest allies in the world. We will always support our ally. The Palestinians have a legitimate aspiration to the state, and we will work to make sure that they can achieve that aspiration while preserving Israel's security. Those two are not mutually exclusive. I think they are mutually interdependent upon each other. Thank you, Colin. Um, Senator Obama. Thank you, Congressman. So uh, we are uh, in a firm time. So uh, everyone that's here, we have one box to see go. So once you, uh, you know, leave this hall and this uh, table, you can grab lunch on the ground. And then um, um, thank you again, Congressman. I'll uh, uh, open it for a closing remarks. Um, thank you. And I want to thank everyone for giving me the opportunity to be with you today. Um, we, we are in a, a challenging time. But uh, as I said in the beginning of this pandemic, if we come together, if we work together, we can beat back this pandemic. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know, you know on the last issue, we may not agree on everything. But that doesn't mean we can't talk to each other and engage with each other. My office door is always open. Uh, I am uh, always happy to talk to anyone and everyone about anything. Uh, one of the things I have talked about in right now is general politics. I raise my kids with the idea that you don't have to prove the other person wrong and confident in what you believe in. The leaders should be so confident in what you know and not to hear what others say and learn. And that's the approach I bring to, to what I do as a representative. I represent 715,000 people roughly in the 10th district. I run as a Democrat, but my job as a representative is representing everyone. Those who voted for me, those who voted against me, those who don't vote, those who don't have voice. And in fact, I see it as my responsibility above the others is to find those without a voice and elevate them so that they can make their voice heard. As a democracy, we are only successful when everyone knows that they are a part of who we are, that we are governed of the people, for the people, by the people. And by that people, we mean all of our people. So thank you for this time. I look forward to continuing our conversation. Uh, I appreciate the, the engagement and uh, wish everyone a, a wonderful rest of your song. Now I'd like to, uh, to welcome uh, the Health Fund Chairman of uh, the Council of Islamic Coalition here in Chicago. Let's go to Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining. But before I make my closing remarks, I really want to turn it over to our Chair for Civic Engagement, Dr. Saba Khan, to make a few comments uh, and update everyone on the upcoming congressional uh, programs. <laughs> Thank you. Hi everyone. My name is Saba and I'm uh, from CIBC here today in the Sunday Council of Economic Organization in the University of Chicago. Before I move ahead with my little two minute talk, I want to thank Congressman Brett Schneider for taking this time and being with us today. Yesterday, last night, I was invited to uh, Independence Day of Pakistan and I guess you were supposed to be one of the guests. I heard your message and your message was uh, right over there and it was very inspiring for the South Asian community. Um, so I thank you for all the uh, things that you talked to us today. There are a few things that have opened doors for us. We may follow up on some of the questions that were brought up today and some of the comments that we heard from you. Uh, we may have to disagree on some of the points. Uh, but this is a congressional town hall where we invite our congressmen and our congressmen so that we get to know them better. We also, one of our goals is also to hold our congressmen accountable for the promises that we made during the election and the votes that we got from the community. I'm very encouraged to see this attendance here today. This is our first in person town hall series, so I appreciate all of you coming here and showing your engagement in these kind of activities. Uh, mashallah, this is great, and we would love to see this more and more. As you know, CRDC is a uh, it's, it's an organization that has close to 60 member organizations and the membership keeps growing. We have close to 400,000 members, people, and there's a CRBC Federation. So when we do these kind of town halls, this is for you, this is for our community, to let you know that 
We are here to help you with any political engagement, any civic related stuff. Please reach out to us. We are here to help you. One thing I do want to uh, give a message to the staff of Congressman. If you have any programs in your office, where our community can come and get involved. We would love our youth and our women and our men to get involved with your offices, maybe an internship or fellowship, because that's another thing that CLDC is working on. A lot of our congressmen the other districts have given us those um, programs that we are kind of actively associating with your office, so we would love to work with your office too. Uh, with that, I'd like to say that in September, our monthly town hall series, we have Congresswoman Mary Newman coming in. We are still figuring out the logistics that it's going to be a person or over the Zoom or maybe both dual modes. We don't know yet, depending on how the COVID rolls out for us. Uh, but that's going to happen in September. This town hall series is happening every month, third Sunday of the month. We try to keep it around the time where people can attend. So if it's over the Zoom, I would encourage all of you to attend. Even though it's not your district, show your support for your communities, come and uh, express your concerns, give us your questions if you have any. August 28th is the March for the Voting Rights, held in few flagship cities such as Washington, D.C., Fairmont, and a few other cities. CRGC is planning out a little setting up a mini rally in Chicago. We may do a rally, we may do a setting up, we're still planning out something on that, but that's a national event that's happening. And it's again about the holding rights of you. So, inshallah, we'll keep you guys posted. And with that, I want to thank everyone again. And I'm going to have the brother Ishaq on the chair of the IBC to meet and hold the room. Thank you, Dr. Uh, brother Ishaq, also remember the audience online. The audience online? Yeah. Yes. So, first, I want to thank everyone who's in present in person. So, thank you for everyone for joining. I know it's really hard uh, for uh, a, s a Sunday morning to come and then take your time out, but being here shows how much you want to be engaged in this really important civic duty that we all have, and, and I'm so glad to see this participant. And I also want to thank those who are uh, joining live uh, streaming. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, uh, first and foremost, I want to thank uh, Congressman Schneider for his time. I know in the past we have reached out to him, uh, and this has been an opportunity for us to be engaged and involved and hear from both sides of it. Uh, it's, I'm glad to hear that there are some uh, policies that he's uh, promoting that is helping the District 10, and inshallah we will be continuing to have this engagement uh, with the District Congressman, and we already have a time with Sarah to set up some time in September that we're going to meet with the small delegation. Those who have already given some questions that was not answered in this forum, uh, please be patient. Uh, our plan is to inshallah take a small delegation and meet with Congressman in his office and then answer those questions for you and get those answers back for you. So stay engaged and stay involved. And again, I want to thank IFM for hosting this uh, today. And also I want to thank all the leadership of the district plan to be here today. And, and show your support as well. So in the end, I really want to thank everyone for joining, and thank you, Congressman, for being here with us today, and thank you, Sarah, for arranging and having all that set up. So thank you. 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 Thank